skyrocketed. Through the spring of 1944, the German Air Force lost between 10 and 30 percent of its fighter pilots each month. While the Luftwaffe always had planes on hand, by the summer of 1944, it faced a pilot shortage so acute that it proved impossible to solve. Even though the Mustang was winning the war in the air, the P-51B model did have a number of bugs that took time to be ironed out. Some of these defects could be disastrous in combat. We had uh, initially a problem with uh, gun feed. You're in a high-speed turn and uh, pull up to so many Gs and it would stop your guns from firing. And the wing was so narrow uh, that you couldn't stand the, the uh, machine guns upright in the wing. They had to be uh, over at about a 45 degree angle. And consequently, the, the uh, belt, when it came over with the shells, every once in a while, as it came over that hump, they'd jam. And uh, so it wasn't at all unusual to uh, fire off a few bursts and have all your guns jam. In fact, a couple of mechanics in our group devised the system which would keep it feeding uh, no matter how many Gs you put on. In the early summer of 1944, most of the issues with the P-51B had been solved. The B would remain in service at least until the end of 1944. But long before that, a new version of the Mustang had entered service. Dubbed the P-51D, it would soon earn a reputation as the ultimate Mustang variant. A lot of the 51s had uh, 1,500, 14 and 1,500 horsepower. The Ds, are the ones they used the most had 1650 in those Packard Merlin engines. The visibility is the main thing, because the Bs and Cs had the windshield and all the glass fared right into the back of the aircraft. The D had a big bubble canopy on it, and you had unlimited visibility in that. And that was the biggest uh, advantage, plus the fact that they had uh, more horsepower a little bit. And they had, uh, six 50 caliber machine guns on board, three in each wing. And they had different drop bomb shackles and stuff on them. Uh, I shot the six several times just to make sure that we knew what was gonna happen because they'd slow you down, oh, 50 miles an hour the minute you start firing. The recoil would slow the airplane right down. And when you had all six of them going, it really, just like that. At this time of the war, a lot of our duty was, was strafing and dive bombing. And with our new Ds, we went out on a dive bombing mission. And uh, we had, in the three missions we flew that day, I think we had eight planes that peeled the wings off on the dive. And the, the extra gun in each wing had weakened the wings so that uh, right in the middle of your dive, a wing would peel back. Uh, not a terrible place to be. You've got a bomb you're writing down, and uh, even if you jump, you're going to be in the middle of the explosion. And they, we got back, they grounded the P-51. And uh, we didn't fly for a couple of days, and then they had modified the wing. We got it back and used it the rest of the war. With the success of the Mustangs in England, fighter units in Italy began converting to the P-51. One of the first outfits to do so was the 332nd Fighter Group, which initially received P-51 Bs and Cs, but finished the war with the D model. Dubbed the Red Tails, the 332nd was one of the most unique organizations in Army Air Force history. The 332nd was the only all-black fighter group in the United States Air Force. Because of the racial situation in America at that time, they were subject to a great deal of abuse and racial prejudice uh, even while they were fighting this war. Uh, but despite those problems that they had with their fellow servicemen, they rose above those issues 
and they performed admirably, especially in the role of escorts for the heavy bombers in the uh, Italian theater. Commanded by Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., seen here briefing his men, the Red Tails took their new job very seriously. Meticulously prepared and dedicated, the 332nd proved to be the outstanding escort group of the war. They had an excellent reputation, and uh, uh, we were very, all, we're always very happy to see them. Uh, they were readily identified with that red tail, and uh, yes, I can. Uh, now that I think about it, I can recall at least once when uh, there were fighters approaching us, and they took off after them, and we went on to the target without uh, a single fighter getting into us. But I'm sure that happened more often than we knew about, too. The 332nd Fighter Group claims one of the most unique distinctions of World War II. Despite all the missions they flew and despite all the opposition they encountered over Germany, especially towards the end of the war, they never lost a bomber that they escorted in any of the groups that they flew with. No other fighter group in World War II can claim that kind of an honor or distinction. While other units scored more aerial victories, the Red Tails earned the respect and admiration of the 15th Air Force's bomber crews. Where once the Tuskegee Airmen had been spurned and derided, by the end of the war, the bomber groups were requesting them as their escort. We had a good escort. The black guys, uh, they, would, uh, they would fly the 51s and They'd come up and uh, as we was coming back off our mission, and see the one one group would take us into the target, and then the other group would, would uh, escort us home. And uh, so as we was es being escorted home, well, uh, the black guys would get out there, and there was one of particular, you know, he, he was a card. He'd get out there and do all kinds of tricks with that plane, you know, it amuses, you know. The Red Tails had become the ultimate little friends, and through their efforts had forged a bond in the air that transcended race and color. Meanwhile, as groups such as the Pioneer Mustangs and the Red Tails battled the Luftwaffe, the P-51 was poised to bring the war home to another enemy, the Japanese. Soon, Mustangs would control the skies over Tokyo itself, ensuring Japan's total and irreversible defeat. Early Mustang variants, such as the P-51A and A-36, had seen action against the Japanese as early as 1943 in the China-Burma-India theater. Those early days of Mustang operations were unspectacular, but the plane did prove to be faster than almost anything the Japanese could pit against it. Most frequently, however, the early Mustangs were called upon to deliver ground strikes, strafing targets in Burma and China. Mustang pilots would also go after shipping along the Burma coast, hoping to choke off the supplies to the Imperial Army fighting in the jungle. It was not until the capture of Iwo Jima that the Mustang truly came into its own in the Pacific. We had a whole bunch of uh, Army P-51 Mustangs. That's the reason we took down, spent all that blood, was to provide a staging base for the P-51s to escort the B-2. 